Welcome to the Recovery and Company podcast, featuring addiction and recovery experts with the latest recovery news, treatment options, therapeutic techniques, causes of addiction, and stories of hope and healing from those in recovery. Welcome back to Recovery and Company. I'm Jody Stevens. This show is a production of the Life Change Center, three locations in Northern Nevada, and we provide services to individuals and families struggling with opioid addiction, heroin pill, fentanyl addiction. You can find out more about us by going to thelifechangecenter.org. And don't miss our second annual Evening of Hope. You are invited. We're excited. It's Thursday, July 28th. It's at the Edge inside the Pepper Mill Resort and Spa. This is a fantastic venue. We're going to have amazing food and drinks and entertainment. And funds raised are going to provide life-saving services to individuals and families putting their lives back together after experiencing opioid addiction. So you can hang out with us, find out more about what we're doing, and also support us by coming to an evening of hope. And you can find out more info and get your tickets by clicking events at thelifechangecenter.org. So welcome back to part two with Eric Schoen. And Eric is the executive director of Community Chess Nevada. They've got three locations providing resources to help families in rural Nevada with things like addiction, substance use disorder, medical treatment, mental health, and so many more great resources and work that you guys are doing, strengthening Northern Nevada. So welcome back, Eric. Eric, do you ever encounter resistance in the rural areas when you're going in and doing all this work? One of the things that, again, people, if they don't understand the microcultures of Nevada, they will also miss that one of the greatest strengths of rural Nevada is its networking, is Mm -hmm. its collaborative spirit. And so this is actually sort of Contrary to how people envision rural Nevada, which is fiercely Mm -hmm. independent, which is true. People are, there's a strong sense of individualism and and, and independence, but there is also the most robust and sophisticated collaborative effort that I've seen statewide. And I Mm -hmm. think it's something that exceeds what is happening in Reno, as well as Las Vegas for, for many, many different reasons. One of those being that you have people who have lived in these rural communities for so long that they know each other easily. Yeah. They trust one another. And there are so few resources that by necessity we have to share if we want to have a chance at meeting the needs of all the different folks who come through the doors. To your, your question, do we bump up against folks in communities who maybe haven't always understood the value of health and, and investing in health and emotional health and treating substance abuse? Absolutely. But I firmly believe that that is less and less than it used to be, in mm-hmm. part because of the pandemic, as I said earlier, yeah. put in such sharp relief what happens when you ignore social connection and, and emotional health and behavioral, yeah. health, behavioral health. You see astronomical increases in the number of overdoses. You see astronomical increases in the numbers of people who are dealing with depression and anxiety and not doing so effectively. I mean, it, the, the argument, it, the damage is clear mm-hmm. and I don't yeah. think that's acceptable for people. I think people are realizing this is not a luxury. This is a necessity as, as, as necessary as sewers and streets and schools and, and primary health care, so is access to treatment for addictions as well as mental health. Is there a, like any kind of a telehealth system for people that like a way to get them mm-hmm. basic computers yeah. and so like a donation, you know, so that, that they oh, can I see get what you're hooked up and then maybe do some telehealth, which isn't the best yeah. way so to do it. Like Zoom, you know, obviously you have a different system for mental health, but I mean, yeah. it's better than not being connected to people. R- Right. So that that's a great question. Uh, and we think of telehealth as this panacea. And it depends on a lot of factors. One, do both the counseling agency, who, whichever is providing the services, as well as the client, intended clients, do they have access to computers or smartphones that are robust enough to be able to connect in real time? So that's number one. Mm-hmm. Number or could two, someone donate? The, like, if you had a program where <laughs> I'm thinking of programs now where people could well, donate them or something like that. But yeah, but true. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, and then secondarily, 
is the internet that's actually the, the, yeah, that's the service issue. available, is it robust enough? Yeah. And is it strong enough? And is it consistent enough that it doesn't go on and off, on and off, that in the rural areas, that would enable really good effective telehealth. And it depends, it depends on where you live. In some cases, there's pretty good telehealth, there's pretty good internet service, uh, there's access to equipment. Um, and so you can do telehealth pretty effectively in some, pla in some places and cases, that's not, that's not yet uh, a realized reality. I know mm -hmm. that, I believe that one of the state's goals from the governor's office is to make sure that all of Nevada has availability to broadband. And so hopefully down the road, that'll cease to be an issue, but it still is a consideration. But for those who do have all of those things, and if need be, if we can find a way to get people the equipment they need, which some agencies I know have, um, have notebooks or tablets that they can mm -hmm. lend out to clients to help do this. Uh, some agencies will have maybe a remote office where the client can go to utilize the equipment in the office and still do telehealth. Um, but there are those workarounds to try to make that happen in the meantime. I think eventually, uh, what's eventually five years, uh, we may yeah. have enough robust connectivity and everybody basically has a smartphone strong enough and robust enough that it, it kind of ceases to be an issue. I got two computers you can have right now. So if yeah. you're listening, donate all your equipment to to Eric with Community Chest. Okay. So, <laughs> um, I love this way of utilizing the community. We talked about this before the interview. I have been to several. I've been to Haiti. I've been to Guatemala a couple times. I traveled with this great organization, providing resources like what you do, but they do to uh, you know, like Central American places like that and. And what, that's one of the things that they do is they'll go into a community. Obviously, Haiti's different than rural Nevada. It's like a fourth world kind of. I mean, it's so. So there is no such thing in Haiti as counseling. There is no such thing as medical. I mean, there's no such thing as a lot of things that we would have here. But one of the things that they do is they'll go into a community and they'll try to find a leader. Like they say, we need to find a leader. So they'll look for a leader and then they'll build they'll build an infrastructure around it but they'll do um you know they'll they'll have like in in one of the communities in Guatemala they put this big fishing pond in and so and then they had some cattle and they that taught the people how to fish and they did all these sorts of things and then we went in and there was this great community that was built around these things and then so when they go in and then they only hire people within that community and they utilize the leaders mm -hmm. and the people yeah. that sort of step up to the plate and then what you end up <laughs> having is jobs right jobs that mm -hmm. so they'll build a school and yeah. then they'll have the people come in from the community that can be teachers and things like so in other words it's all staying within the community now you have jobs and a natural infrastructure built in and that's how they've, you know, it's the whole concept of don't give them a fish, teach them to fish. Mm -hmm. You know, you've heard that. It's kind of that whole concept. It seems like what you're utilizing is a lot of what people tend to do in the the third world to try to develop resources. Well, and I, I think, you know, if people are having a hard time, even after we've discussed it for a few minutes here, visualizing this, there is a great documentary on Netflix called Bending the Ark. And oh, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's about an organization that was trying to treat either um, drug-resistant TB or drug-resistant HIV in Haiti, of all places. Mm -hmm. And they initially, it was a group of doctors and some medical uh, professionals. They initially tried sort of the, I think, traditional first world approach, which is to set up shop and assume that people will come because the resource is there. And yeah. it didn't do well. And they're very clear in this documentary that it just it was the wrong approach and yeah. it was based on a lot of uh, assumptions that didn't carry over. What they hit upon was exactly what we're talking about, which is utilizing community health workers who were of and from these different remote villages. And I mean, that's kind of generous. Some of them were just an encampment of, of different places. But community health workers who yeah. already had the earned authority within their home communities mm -hmm. who could function as ambassadors and translators and counselors and friends who could also provide guidance and support 
and Gunjol when needed to comply with the medication regimen. And what they found were astronomical rates of success that nobody yeah. thought that they could that they could accomplish. Well, they replicated this again in I think Peru, um, mm-hmm. and then they replicated it again in in Africa. And so folks have a chance to watch that. What's not different about uh, those countries and in rural Nevada is the same sort of social connectivity that is yeah. important to understand so that that can be harnessed in a positive way. You're developing local talent, you're developing local capacity, developing local expertise, you're utilizing those relationships to flip on a community's um, desire for better health. Because I think yeah. communities, just like people, I think most folks want to optimize how well they feel, how how much they can perform. Uh, and I, communities are, are, are organisms of themselves, of multiple people who, if shown, like, you know, to tie it back to where we were, were earlier talking about what you and I learned in counseling, that there were tools that we could use to increase our satisfaction and enjoyment of yeah. life. So there are tools for communities to do the same thing on behalf of everybody in that community. Well, and it gives the, the I mean, if, if people just roll in and set up shop, like you said, how does that help the other person? Because so much of what gives our life meaning and value is having purpose, having, mm-hmm. I don't want to use necessarily the word job, but that's huge. And so many people, whether it's you're in the third world or you're in rural Nevada, you may feel like there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to, to do, the, you know, and that contributes to the anxiety and depression. And when you're dealing with a, a place like that where there's just nothing, you have to realize that depression and anxiety can be very environmental because and- you feel like there's just nothing here. There's no way to get a job. There's no way to get food. There's no way to, you know, and so by giving people that sense of purpose, like mm-hmm. I'm thinking of like the feeding center in Haiti, it's all Haitians that run this feeding center. And occasionally the organization comes in, how's things going? What do you guys need? Right. But it's all ran by them. <laughs> people walk six to eight miles to get a bucket of food. And, mm-hmm. but then now the people that work there, that's their purpose. That's their sense. That's what they're doing. They're helping other people and, and yada, yada. And you set up a, something similar and you could take, you could take this same model and go into any community, you know, downtown Vegas mm-hmm. or wherever, yeah. where you're just you're just saying, hey, instead of being on the street, why don't you come work in this community center and help these youth? And, you know, just mm-hmm. so things like that. Right. Yeah. Well, and I would add, in addition to the sense of purpose and, you know, having a, a job that feels like it's contributory and adding value. It, we all of those things have to happen within the context of human relationships. Yeah. It, it seems really clear. The data seems really, really clear that we can't accomplish emotional and psychological health without being in relationship with people who with, having positive social support. So people mm-hmm. who love us for for the, for the right reasons, people who want to be in relationship and support us for the right reasons, and that we can do the same for. Those reciprocal, positive social supports are absolutely a key, key part of whether it's you know, resolving anxiety, depression, or getting to the other side of, of an addiction. We have to have those positive social supports. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's huge. We're just wired for community. We're wired mm-hmm. for connection. We don't always like that about ourselves. <laughs> Sometimes we're like, if only I could just do this all alone. <laughs> that's just not how we're made. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm more of an introvert and you know, it's like, oh, do I have to need people? But we do. It's just how we are, you know. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I find myself stuck in my head, the minute it starts to get better is when I finally have the courage to talk to somebody. Oh yeah, totally. And then I totally. kick, or, my, yep. kick, kick myself in the pants and say, you know, you know better. You, you're you're a trained mental health professional. You mm-hmm. should have talked to somebody, you know, ten minutes ago. But it's like, okay, yeah, I, I have to relearn that lesson time and time again. Or doing something that's huge. That yeah. is absolutely for me. It's like, even if you just do the dishes, it's just action mm-hmm. is huge. And and sure. working through the. You know, I always say the only way out is through it, whether it's fear, depression, whatever it is, you, you've got to walk through it. You can't 
avoid it. And walking through it can be the best thing that you do because you realize, you know, with especially with anxiety, it's sort of the boogeyman in the closet. Well, and, and you, you talked about sometimes, even if, if you're not feeling it, getting yourself to, to do something anyway. And there's a fancy term for, I think it's behavior activation or something like that. But, uh, but yes, but the basic idea is exactly what you're talking about, that through that a- action, whether it's uh, washing dishes or going for a walk or something yeah. productive like that, we can then change the, the, the thought patterns that we're having and the emotions mm-hmm. that we're feeling and through action get ourselves. And we may not always have the, the sort of the internal mental tools to get ourselves there, but through that positive action, we can find ourselves at least in the neighborhood. Yeah, no, that's so true. Tell me about the resources available in communities, what's lacking, or maybe the better <clears throat> suggestion would be what's kind of a typical, I don't know, day, week, month, year for you guys when you go into a community? What are some of the things you do see, set up, utilize, and how do you do it? Sure. That's a well, huge question, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, and yeah, no, it's a great question because uh, I think it kind of. Each of our locations is sort of at a at a different point of birth from the others, mm-hmm. and so in Virginia City, where we started, we've been here thirty, going on thirty one years, and we started off small. We were in a rented space with with uh, one half time volunteer and a really small grant, and we've grown now to be a staff of nearly fifty with five different offices. Mm, but in, wow. in in Virginia City. What there, there was nothing here. There's no health and human services, uh, uh, publicly funded county health and human services department. Uh, and so it quickly became apparent that we were being asked to do more and more. Could we yeah. do youth programs? Could we do counseling? And the founders had two boys who were young, and so they wanted to provide these youth programs. And so pretty soon we were adding a food pantry, we were adding a comprehensive counseling program, before and after school programs. And it just kind of grew from there to the point where we now have a 10,000 square foot community center. We provide comprehensive youth programs, primary health care, behavioral health care, early childhood education. We run the county library, food pantry, but all in an integrated one stop shop uh, mm. so that people only have to come through one door and we can kind of get them hooked into these different resources, domestic violence, in, uh, employment case management. But that has happened through being in relationship and living and, and working in this community through 30 years of, of just getting to know people and them trusting us and vice versa. And so that model for us, we realize if we are to be effective in any other community, we have to be humble enough to, to spend time in those communities, get to know them, understand where they're coming from, and then kind of work alongside from like a, from basically a servant-based leadership model. And so in Fernley, we have an office, uh, a building uh, off of uh, the road that goes to Silver Springs, uh, and that has employment case management services, comprehensive counseling programs. It also has our out-of-school youth employment program for youth who are between the ages of 18 and 24 who flunked out of uh, or didn't do well in regular school and now are trying to earn their high set or GED equivalent, also looking for work experience. We also have domestic violence uh, services there. We have a small office in Dayton as well. We have a brand new office in Yarrington where we're providing domestic violence and comprehensive counseling programs. We have an office in Hawthorne that uh, also provides a lot of these programs. And I forgot to mention our in-home case management programs Mm. for families of kiddos zero to five who um, we have a, a home visitor who will come work with them during that entire time frame to make sure that the parents have what they need for the kiddos to be healthy and for the kiddos to make sure they have access to the resources they need. We also run a mobile preschool that we call Classroom on Wheels or CalBus. There used to be several of these programs throughout Nevada. You would see them in Las Vegas and Reno, Elko, and our, our program where the cow buses would be painted with splotches looking like cows. And the uh-huh. interior of these buses were basically the seats have been ripped out. And they were mobile 
uh, mobile preschools. And so we oh. we have uh, the last remaining cow bus program in the state. Uh, we run that program in Lyon County, primarily, Story County as well. And then we also provide services down to Tonopah. So all of those are kind of in different stages of gestation and relationship building and trust building. And what we find is once we're able to be in a community for a while, community members through conversation, other needs are identified. And then we try to be resourceful, mutually resourceful in identifying how that need might be met. Sometimes it's through us. We'll try to identify a program we might have. Sometimes it's helping, like you talked about earlier, the community to, community to identify possibilities and opportunities and, and go for those themselves and develop those mm -hmm. resources. So it doesn't always need to be us. In fact, I'd rather it not be us because I think in the long run, all of these communities have the skills and the resources needed to, to, to take care of a lot of the things they need to. But until we're to that point, we kind of help to, to function as a bridge to make sure people have access to those resources. I love that. It's kind of this model of build up the community and move on. Not yep. really, but you know what I mean? Yep. Where you're, yep. And it sounds like you're employing a lot of locals, which is cool. That's, yeah, that's, we found as we've, discussed earlier, we found that yeah. they are the ones who are most committed to seeing positive change. They can see the positive change. So a lot of people who come And a from, lot of these are like paid positions though too, right? I would imagine. Yeah, you know, they're all, yeah, pretty, all paid positions. So folks who come from outside of the area frequently mm -hmm. see the glass half empty. Folks who live in their own home communities can see the glass half full. Yeah, and that, that optimism, yeah. that, that potential for change, not only for an ind individual, but a community is, is an absolutely key component. Wow. And um, tell me about just some of the school programs. Do you guys go into the schools or are a lot of these like after school programs and things like that? We do both. So we uh, in Story County School District, we provide counseling within the schools at all four schools. Uh, we also provide after school counseling for those kiddos. We also do the same thing in Silver Springs in, in uh, Silver Stage High School where we provide supportive mental health programs. Uh, in terms of before and after school programming, that's available at our Virginia City and Lockwood locations for those mm -hmm. folks who are not familiar with Lockwood, that's east of Sparks, but it's part of Story County. And we have before and after school programming for elementary and middle school students, as well as full uh, summer programming. What kind of issues are the kids facing? Is it is it similar to kids everywhere in these more rural communities, or are there some more kind of specific issues related to rural Nevada that kids and are dealing with? In some ways, kids are like magnifying glasses for what we're all feeling and going through. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> so at least they'll talk about it sometimes, unless they're 13. Well, then maybe or, or, yeah, or they'll act it out. Uh, but the mm -hmm. kind of weird squirrely sensation we've all been having post COVID where yeah. we know we haven't had enough social uh, interaction or maybe some of us know that, but we've been so used to being isolated, even if it's not good for us, that it's still kind of uncomfortable yeah. to be social again. And so yeah. you're seeing, you're seeing the same awkwardness with the youth. You're seeing the same kind of acting out in some ways mm -hmm. you're seeing, I think because of some other uh, issues, global warming and the war in Ukraine. Uh, I think you're seeing youth question uh, reality in a way that yeah. hasn't been questioned in a while. So you're seeing a number of them who are having a hard time finding the motivation to why should they continue in school? Why does it matter if the plan, if the plan is going to explode anyway, or what have you? you know, t tell me why school is really that important. And besides, I'm not having a lot of fun doing school if I, if I have to do it on the computer, you know, most of the, most of the day. So we, what, how that's affecting our kiddos emotionally, certainly increased levels of stress, certainly increased levels of, I think I would call it trauma, certainly yeah. increased levels of anxiety, increased levels of depression, all of the above. Stay away from the news, kids. <laughs> Well, and that doesn't help because it's just, you know, the whole yeah. concept of, and I could go on this for another hour, so we won't go there. But, you know, I mean, it's like if it, if, you know, the whole Dirty Laundry song, we all remember that by Don Henley, and it's now even worse if it bleeds, it leads. But, you know, it's just like they've got to go from one hysteria to the next. It's just like, right. stop, 
Just yeah. stop it already. Gosh, yeah. it drives me crazy. But yeah. if you're a kid, you don't know. As adults, we're just like, oh, God, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can see some of it. I mean, it's just, oh, I'm sure you get clients that come in. They're just freaked out about the news. I mean, my mom and my parents are afraid, you know. It's just, it's frustrating. And they'll call me and did you hear this and that. It's like, Mom, turn off the TV. Mm -hmm. You know, well, you know, the, the <laughs> pandemic made it harder, I think, for some of us who were doing addictions counseling, because yes. at least when you're working with somebody pre pandemic, we could say, you know, it looks like you've lived most of your life, maybe under the influence of something, you know, drunk or stoned or high or what have you. But yeah. you haven't really ever experienced reality. Maybe reality is not as bad of a trip as you might think that it might be. You know, what's what's the worst Worst thing that could happen. And so mm -hmm. sometimes that would work, right? People would be like, oh, you know, you're right. I'm going to give reality a chance. And oftentimes, mm -hmm. guess what? Reality turned out to be the better choice. But during the pandemic, it was harder to make that argument because people would say, what? Look, look at the world around me. Everything's shut down. I, yeah. I'm unemployed. I can't go to work. I can't afford my bills. Reality is not better for me right now. Oh, yeah. Gosh. And so I think you saw a lot of folks give up hope. A lot of folks, and what you know, and then once you give up hope, then it's a downward spiral from there. Um, and so, mm -hmm. how do we, how do we recast for hope? How do we affirm that even with all of this, it, it appears that you know the world has its hair on fire, even in that kind of a context? How do we hold on to hope? And, yeah. you know, Victor Frankl, uh, he survived. He was a psychoanalyst who survived. I know. Yeah. The Holocaust or, or I'm yeah. sorry, the concentration camp. I love his story. Yeah. And he, he's got a great book that's really accessible to anybody. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search First for part Meaning, of the book yeah. is really just kind of a biography of his experience. And the second part mm -hmm. is uh, sort of laying out uh, his his the approach to psychology uh, yeah. the, and, and living life that he took from that. And he, I think it was him that came up with the term logotherapy, the idea yeah. of, of, of identifying meaning, um, yep. as a, as a reason for, and you, t you think about a guy who could have easily given up. There he is concentration yeah. camps. There's n everything's been stripped away. Uh, all yes. of his loved ones have mostly perished and he would find small things that would give his life meaning. And I think he mentions a flower at one point, seeing the beauty of a rose mm -hmm. or a flower uh, or, or a certain human uh, momentary gesture or something like that. But whatever it is, meaning can give us the direction and I think the will and be the seed of hope that we need to, to keep moving forward. Amen. That's so true. Then I think of the Cory Ten Boom, you know, in the concentration camp, they're they're looking at the ants, you know, or <laughs> yeah. things like that. Or they there yeah. were fleas in their concentration camp, so they didn't get you know abused because the guards didn't want to go into the fleas. And so there's all these things. But I totally hear what you're saying because that's you know when I look at the world today, I think what a great opportunity to help people. What a great yeah. opportunity to bring hope. What a great opportunity yeah. to utilize community, to utilize peer yeah. support. And what a great opportunity for us to come together as a community, because we're certainly not going to get it from our government and our media. So <laughs> I, I feel like there's just so many opportunities. But you're right. It has to be it has to come from within because mm -hmm. it's you know, we have to work on finding that helping people connect with their strength and connect with the the meaning that they can bring to the table because then that mm -hmm. brings people to um utilize their gifts and strengths and that's i think where the where the real healing takes place is when it's not about what can i get it's about waking up and going what can i give and that's when change takes place like when you know if someone's struggling with depression or emptiness mm -hmm. you know and without being preachy it's kind of like you want to say well what are you doing sort of to give back. Because mm -hmm. when we get to that point, instead of what can I get, what can I give, I think that's where we can really begin to heal as humans. Oh, I, I, I think you're, you're spot on. And, and I think too, we've realized in the last few years, we used to think that 
people had to be quote ready for for counseling yeah. or for, for change and we realize now that's people even if they're you know court ordered for counseling and maybe they're going quote against their will we've yeah. actually been able to see success rates equivalent uh, mm -hmm. or exceed those of people who are self-referred and so you know the old canard that somebody had to hit rock bottom that's not necessarily the case um, yeah. there, there, there are ways as, as counselors and, and people who want to try to to help people uh, find and, and use those tools. There are ways to to engage no matter where somebody's at on their journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and as, as a therapist or counselor, it's kind of part of our job to get them ready. How can I help mm -hmm. them to move yep. away from that ambivalence and... Yeah. You know, and so that's why I love what you were talking about, the motivational interview and mm -hmm. all that stuff, which yep. could be a whole nother show. But it's really just about get, moving people away from the ambivalence and Absolutely. toward Absolutely. toward change, yeah. you know, which Absolutely. is so yeah. important. Well, Eric, it has been so great to have you here. We could probably talk for another hour, but I know you actually have a job to do and I have a job to do, and you know. Um, but it's been so great to have you here, Eric. Again, Eric is the um, community, the executive director of Community Chest, three locations. Eric, um, how can we get in touch with you um, and your organization and get involved? Yeah, so I think if folks listening to this just want to reach out to me directly, it's mm -hmm. Eric, E-R-I-K, at Community Chess Nevada, all one word, all spelled out, dot net. Again, Eric, E-R-I-K, at Community Chess Nevada, dot net. Or they can call our main number, 775-847-9311, and somebody will help. Cool, and you guys have a website, too. Oh, yeah, we do. I'm sorry, www.communitychessnevada.net. Does it, did we cover everything, Eric? Is there anything that I forgot to no, mention I, that you want to I say? think we covered everything. I really appreciate <laughs> the time, and uh, I hope this was a benefit for the folks who are listening. It was. Thank you so much again for being here, Eric. And friends, thanks for listening. Share this show on social media if you would. I, we would love that. You can hit the share button on any of the apps you're listening through. Again, iTunes and Spotify, TuneIn, Amazon, or click media and then podcast at the Life Change Center. Org. And of course, we always need support. So feel free to hit the donate button. And as I always say, be a part of the solution, helping people recover. So thanks again for listening, friends, and we will talk to you next time.